You know, we obviously talk about ghosts on this show, but do ghosts ever talk about us amongst themselves? On a recent EPP bonus episode titled Dead or Alive, we hear the story of spirits who gather in a little boy's room and seem to discuss the family and the home they inhabit. You won't forget this one. It's a -a one-of-a-kind ghost story, and you're only going to hear it in our EPP bonus section. Sign up to be an EPP. It's only $5 a month. You keep the wind and the sails of the show. You keep it afloat. You keep it on the air with all the free episodes, and you get access to more than 50 bonus episodes, exclusive video content, and so much more. Please sign up at realghoststoriesonline.com, and let's keep Real Ghost Stories Online on the air. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And on today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, we hear a possible explanation for the scream of death heard before a loved one dies. Also, a good deed turns terrifying when a group of high schoolers are given the task to clean up an old church. A mysterious lady strikes up an unsettling conversation with a listener. And a troubled woman takes her own life but is still very unhappy in the afterlife those stories your calls and more today on real ghost stories online tony and jenny bruski joining you once again hello so the scream mm-hmm. are we talking like the death sigh or this is it like is this, is this a scream pertaining to a specific story we've had or- a couple of stories where people claim they've heard a scream or a relative of theirs heard a scream and it kind of foretold somebody dying and okay it wasn't the person dying screaming either. oh okay it's not like the death sigh no okay that's kind of what i was thinking sure. but but okay i get i, I remember what you're saying or there have been some stories like that i don't know where it's coming from what it's involving or what it's pertaining to yes <coughs> quite shortly thereafter someone kicks it right right there's and- also the death cough when tony coughs trying to <laughs> read a story no and i think we had a caller or yeah, I think maybe it was a caller a couple weeks ago had two grandparents didn't know each other mm-hmm. who both had instances where they heard that. The unexplained scream. Mm-hmm. All right. This should be interesting. 855-853-4802. That's our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Suddenly this afternoon, I feel kind of coffee-ish, meaning coughing-ish. I think it's because they're uh, they're shucking corn yeah, they're harvesting. Right, right behind our studio. Uh-huh. Shucking is, is it is it considered shucking when it's a large tractor? Shucking is more so when it's like by hand, right? Yeah. They're harvesting ha- is harvesting. The, the massive machinery that's uh, going out back there. Yes. Yes, corn is in the air, my friends. <laughs> corn is in the air. Like that's that. great. 855-853-4802. Let's try and survive reading the stories here today. Abby. Right, so I'm not sure how close to the paranormal one would consider this, but as I experienced it, it truly is an unexplainable thing in my life. When I was still in high school around 2005 or 2006, I went to a very out-of-the-way country school. When I say small, I mean that the school itself at K through 12, they're all in one small campus. My graduating class was only 24 students. One of the requirements for credits to graduate was community service around the small town. It was spring when we did this, and good weather besides. No rain, no wind. Really, it was just a mild, somewhat cool spring day. We were put into groups with an adult chaperone for each group, given various tasks around town. My group was sort of the rejects of the school group, the kids no one really liked, the slackers, and those that just didn't really care much. We were given the task to accompany the local uh, sewage guy in cleaning a small church. This truck was fitted with a giant plastic bin filled with water and a giant pressure hose. Now, the church in question was and still is a tiny Methodist church, so small that it appeared to just be the chapel, some seats, and the bell tower. A typically shaped small country church, if you will. It had two windows on either side, and they were not blocked by any curtains or shades. You could see right through from one end to the other. Our task was a simple one. Take the hose and spray down the church, spray the sides, spray the windows, done deal. 
Seemed easy enough at the time. We each got a turn holding the hose and spraying the siding, but that's when the weird began to happen. As I took my turn spraying the church, I noticed that the sides were built with long layered wooden slats. From beneath it, the water pushed our brown reddish gunk that never seemed to stop coming. We all thought this was a little weird. Even the sewage guy was scratching his head and wondering why it just kept coming. I quietly noted to myself that it almost resembled old blood being washed out from under the slats, but I didn't voice this to the others as I handed off the hose and moved to go sit and laze about with the other kids. We only had one hose. What was the point of doing anything else? Then I noticed it. The windows could no longer be seen through. They were black, dark, and completely as if something had covered the entire window in a dark ream of paper. I couldn't see the other side. As I looked, thinking it odd, I noticed the blackness was moving, stepping closer. I realized that to my horror, the windows were covered in black, squirming, buzzing flies, the worst part. They were inside the church, covering the windows. I screamed for the others to come and look. They couldn't believe it flies, flies so thick that no light from the other side shone through. I ran to check the other side, and it was the same thing. I heard a buzzing from a buzz and looked up to see a cloud of swarming flies buzzing over the church as if it were uh, the, a gutted, rotting corpse. The sewage man noticed too and began to get as freaked out as we were. Turned off the hose and proposed we abandon the job and just say it got done. We all agreed. Helping the man pack up, I couldn't help but think on how disturbing this whole scene was. My English class had recently, as in only a year or two ago, finished reading Lord of the Flies. My mind kept flipping back to the image described in the book of a pig's head shoved on a stick and covered in flies. I felt sick. I could hardly eat my lunch when we got back to the school. I've wanted for a long time now. Could something more sinister and perhaps even demonic be at work in that tiny little church? Or is it just some freakish act of nature? I don't know, but I think there has to be something that draws that many flies. Whether it's something dead or rotting or something dark. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's very bizarre. I don't know how I would say for sure if it was something demonic. My mind goes back to like Amityville. Yeah. And, and things of that nature. It's uh, certainly questionable as if it was a natural occurrence. See, I was just thinking there may be something dead in that church. But why on the windows alone and on both sides? trying to get to light okay but uh, but from the outside outside coming in because of the smell is what you're saying no i'm saying that something essentially grew maggots and they turned okay. into flies inside that church okay but didn't, didn't they she say that there was also flies on the other side of the window too like covering both sides no my understanding was like because the church looked just like just the chapel. Okay. You can see usually there's windows across from each other. Sure. That it was covering that window and the other window. Oh, okay. I was taking it as on, on both sides of the pane. No, just there's a massive amount of flies in that church. Yeah. That's... <laughs> yeah. Something I don't want to see. No. Paranormal? I don't know. Certainly a possibility. 855-853-4802. That's our number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Dawn writes into us. On the 24th of last year, my husband's sister killed herself. She was 54 years old. My husband was not very close to his sister, as nor I. For some reason, she had issue with me and thought I should do everything for her parents. Linda lived two hours away. My husband and I had a very busy and full life. His parents never call, never come over unless I made dinner for them, so I was not real hip on spending my time off catering to them. My husband's parents were never loving towards him, so it was just an odd relationship, to say the least. Two days after the funeral, my husband received a copy of the police report, as well as a letter she wrote. The letter stated that she wanted my husband to look after his parents. Mow the grass, keep up the outside. I did not show my husband this letter that day because it was a guilt letter. My husband's parents are very well to do and can afford a lawn service, but refuse to. If it was a money issue, I'd be glad to help. 
The night the letter came, I just so happened to fall asleep on the couch. I woke to a freezing cold gust of air blowing into my ear and then a full cold rush to my entire body, which was now frozen in fear and unable to move. I saw nothing, but I tried to get up, but I could not. I was able to raise one hand to have my own hand slap me in the face. Picked up my other hand to try to stop the other from slapping my face. This went on for a while. Both my hands were in front of my face with me pushing back and whoever pushing towards my face trying to slap with both my hands. I was able to get up and ran upstairs in horror. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was Linda and she was pissed I did not show this letter to my husband. As I said, they were not a close family. I did give the letter to my husband and he declined to read it. Linda was in the devil worship and had a mean heart. At her funeral, you could clearly see the evil on her face. I had this happen again several days later. It was the same thing, cold air into my ear and down my body. I was able to get up and move. I stood in the middle of the room screaming, Linda, get the fuck out of my house. I have not had another experience again. There's so much more to the story, but I did not want to make this too long. It sounds like the Brady Bunch. I couldn't help but think of that. You you probably don't know because you didn't have a sibling, but Christopher and I, would, uh, me being the older, meaner child, uh -huh. I would get on top of him and take his hand and make him hit himself in the face with his own hand uh -huh. and, and say, why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? I couldn't help but think of that when she was describing how the ghost was making her hit her face. From the undead or from the dead. Yeah. Hit, hit herself. Uh-huh. That'd be horrible. That would be awful. <laughs> when it's a sibling doing it, you can determine what's going on. Sure. It's another when it's unseen forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. Or it's probably her. That's. I, I would love to hear what, what more there is to that story, too. Yeah. It sounds like there's quite a bit. Next letter. Let me start by saying that I've had a religious upbringing in a pastor's family. A Pentecostal heritage brought me into a lot of supernatural situations and face to face with entities outside of this world. I've worked for a while in a ministry that dealt with demonic manifestations, but none of those have stood out to me like the story I'm about to tell you. I was 18 years old the summer this story took place. My family lived in a particular apartment complex for six years and we were in the middle of packing to move out. I had taken a break and gone down to the courtyard surrounding an indoor pool. As I was sitting, a woman about six feet tall, wearing all white, came and sat on a bench near me. She had slicked black, platinum blonde hair and pulled out a cigarette. She struck up a conversation with me and began asking me questions about my life. She guessed without me telling her that I came from a pastor's family. and She was just generally encouraging person. There were private things going on in my life at the time that she seemed to know about. She never mentioned anything specifically, but everything she said seemed to be something I needed to hear to know how to navigate what I was dealing with personally. I asked her how long she had lived in the apartment complex since I'd never seen her. She said she'd been there for six years, same amount of time I had lived there, and said that she was also getting ready to move somewhere else. I cannot explain what I was feeling as I wasn't even sure I was speaking to a human being at that point. I was unsure if this was an angel, a psychic, or some kind of prophet I was dealing with, but it was a truly inspiring conversation we had. What happened just before she and I said goodbye to each other is where it got weird. Two men showed up. They were wearing average-looking attire like t-shirts and jeans. They didn't look to me like troublemakers, but the woman, the woman gave them a hard look. Have they ever bothered you? She asked me. I told her I'd never seen them before. Just then she stood up. When she did, the men immediately looked at her with expressions of horror on their faces. She said to them, you have no business here, and you know it, get out. These two athletic looking men ran like they were being chased by the police from this woman, who looked to be in her fifties. After they disappeared, I saw that her eyes were wet with tears. They know they don't belong here, but they never seem to leave, she said. With that, she wished me luck in whatever I did, with my life and said goodbye to me. I've wondered ever since what to attribute that experience to. She had lived the same amount of time I had. But I never saw her until that day when we were both getting ready to move away. Was this an angel or some sort of protective spirit? I've never been sure of the existence of guardian angels, but this has left plenty of questions in my mind. Any thoughts? Thank you for the show. 
I listen at work every day. Also, I'm considering getting involved with some paranormal investigation groups in my area. Do you guys have any advice that I should keep in mind while looking into that? I think since we don't do investigating, we should open that up to yeah. our listeners who do. Because no, I don't. No, we have quite a few listeners that do. So if somebody could start a thread on the message board, that would be great. I, I'm guessing on her story that she appeared to her in one way. Mm-hmm. And her appearance looked something very different to those men. I almost wondered whether or not those men were also ghosts. The way she was saying they're always around here. And they're not never leave Mm -hmm. and they're not supposed to be here but they never leave that could be that too that would explain the the guys being able to see the ghost as well sure i can see that angle my my angle of it was you know how we talk about how sometimes spirits can choose who they appear to or or and and how they appear to someone my thought is she was appearing just as a normal 50 some looking year old woman giving advice Mm -hmm. to her Mm mm-hmm and maybe something very, very scary to these men, sure. if they if they were human. Yeah. And that's what made them freak out and run away. Mm-hmm. Or it could be the spirit a- angle of things, or it could be something that she's constantly trying to protect this woman from, yes. if they were human. Or, or, or the others. It could be any of those. Either. Either yeah. way. Choose your own adventure. Mm-hmm. It's one of those. <laughs> but uh, very, very interesting letter. So that's that's my that's our take uh, on it. Uh, just gave you about twenty different possible scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Candace writes in, "Hey Tony and Jenny, love the show. This is the third story I've written into your show. I listen almost every day through your uploads on YouTube, and always enjoy hearing people's stories." I listen to a lot of scary videos of ghost stories and whatnot, but I have to say your reading of the stories is much more professional than most of the readers I hear online, though I love them too. But it's probably because you have an excellent radio voice. Before I tell my story, I know that I'm so very jealous because I have always wanted to be a DJ and would love to be able to tell people's ghost stories like you and Jenny do. I'm sending this story in on your birthday, so maybe that compliment can serve as a present for your special day. There we go. So this was sent back on August 5th. Yes. Okay. Uh, God bless you all. Anyway, now for my story. I'm not particularly long or profound, but when it was told to me by my dad, made me want to cry up in the middle of the long John Silvers where I and my parents were having lunch after church and talking about all the random stuff we'd find ourselves cr- uh, conversing over. I'm writing this in August of 2015, but back in February of this year, my father's mother, my grandmother, who we called Nini, passed away in her sleep in a nursing home after a long battle with a long list of medical issues. I come from a strong Christian family, and Nini, kind of the family matriarch, was a woman of strong faith, and her death was kind of a hard blow to our family. She left behind a big family that misses her sorely, including a husband of over 60 years, and while as a very loving father, grand and great father, great-grandfather, with a wonderful sense of humor and a hard work ethic, He is the most practical man I've ever met, with no time for nonsense, like being afraid of ghosts or anything like that. He's quoted as saying that he is not afraid of finding himself in a graveyard because he's not afraid of the dead. It's those live ones you gotta worry about. He grew up in the old school where his birthstone is the grindstone. If that gives you any idea of the man I'm talking about, Papa, as we call him, hasn't been in the best health himself, so much so that He was in the hospital when we held Nini's funeral in the 1st of March and wasn't able to attend himself. This, however, hasn't affected his state of mind, which has always been super strong. This point in particular is what gets me the most when I think about the story that my dad told me this past Sunday at lunch. He told me that he and my mom took Papa out for dinner to his favorite local place, Country Cooking. They had a nice time, but... When they all got back in the car to go home, Papa seemed to be itching to tell them something. My dad said that Papa told them that he was hesitant to say anything because he was afraid that people would assume he was losing his mind from grief or old age or both. When he told them what it was he was experiencing every night in the home where he and Nini lived for over 40 years, Papa says that he gets up every morning between 4 and 5 to use the bathroom But when he's up, every morning he hears a woman's voice coming from the living room area. 
Papa lives alone now that Nini has passed away. My parents, my aunt, and my sister all live next door to Papa in their respective homes, but he is the sole occupant of that house. Papa says he is certain that it is Nini's voice that he's hearing, but he can't make out what she's saying to him. He says that he has come into the living room to investigate. This man ain't, isn't afraid of anything, I'm telling you right now. And here's Nini's voice coming from the recliner she always sat in. The same one I still think of her being in when her image comes to mind. Even as I write this, I kind of want to cry because I can't imagine what Papa must be feeling, both in the wake of Nini's absence and with the knowledge that there's something in his home that calls out to him in the night with Nini's voice. He said that he doesn't feel afraid, which I doubt he would anyway. When he hears this voice, Nini often spoke of hearing something running up and down their hallway when she was alive, among other things she experienced in and around that house. The house sits on 30 acres of land that once belonged to a plantation. We got tons of those here in the South, but I don't know much about the family that owned the plantation. I could tell you plenty more stories about experiences I myself and my siblings have had on that property. I'll save them for another time. I can't say for sure what it is Papa's hearing in his house, but I have a strong feeling that whatever or whoever it is, is there to comfort him. The Bible briefly speaks of a person's angel, like a guardian angel that serves a specific purpose. My dad suggests that maybe that's what Papa hears. And since Nini is in heaven and doesn't need her angel anymore, that that angel now speaks as she did to tell Papa that Nini is okay. Sorry, this ran on for this ran on for as long as it did. Wanted to say thanks for reading my schoolhouse story on your ominous occupant episode. Totally made my day. Keep it all up, y'all. God bless. You know, I I have no reason to doubt whether or not it's Nini. Mm -hmm. But I know that if she's hearing, if she was hearing things when she was alive, there's always that chance of something else being there that's just copying her sound. Yeah. Which is the interesting part is the fact that that is saying that she was experiencing other things there before. Mm -hmm. Which could be not such a good thing. Trying to lure someone in yeah. at a very vulnerable point in time. It's a very difficult one to officially diagnose because it could just be a peaceful thing. It could be. But, you know, with the grandfather having just recently in the mm -hmm. last six months lost his long time wife mm -hmm. he's probably not in the best place as far as his emotions go sure so i think you just really have to watch that i agree i i do agree thank you for writing in and sharing that story with us the phone number here is 855-853-4802 of course you can write in on the website realghoststoriesonline.com and hey be sure to press subscribe whatever platform it is you listen to our show on we greatly appreciate that that uh, helps us grow in those ratings and other folks finding us and uh, ends up uh, making a better show for you. Danny writes in, hey, Tony and Jenny, love the show so much. And like so many have said before, it helps me get through my work day with ease. Anyway, I wanted to tell you my story. My earliest memory is from when I was four years old. I had scarlet fever at the time, and I remember waking up in the middle of the night and seeing a woman in a long white dress kneeling next to my bed. She had a faint glow to her. We made eye contact, and I swear she had the kindest eyes I've ever seen. She reached toward me, and her hand went through my chest. Then she nodded and disappeared. I can't explain why or how I fell back asleep, but I did. I recovered afterwards and haven't been majorly sick since. I understand that this could have easily been a fever dream, but I have strong feelings it's not. Another thing that may be unrelated is that oftentimes when I walk or drive under a street light, they go out immediately. I'm interested to know if you guys think this sounds paranormal or not. Thanks for all you do. I think when you have a high fever or anytime your body's under that much duress, you can see spirits probably easier because it's almost like being closer to death. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was like a hallucination because of fever. Well, it can also, uh, from, you know, based on the stories that we've heard, folks that have come near to death mm -hmm. um, and and ended up seeing things, when they come back out and are completely healthy, sometimes it almost appears as if they've opened up some sort of gateway that sticks with them. 
Yeah. Where it's not just there in the, the close to death stage. It's like, oh, now you have this extra sense, if you will, mm -hmm. that you may not have had before. So, yeah, very real possibility that you could have been seeing something and not just a hallucination. As far as the lights turning on and off, that I believe is called a slider. It is. And uh, yeah, I, I used to have that a lot. Yeah. I don't necessarily think I do it so so much anymore. Mm -hmm. But when I was younger, I would have that that weird occurrence. I don't know what the term slider comes from. I believe it was like originated in a movie or a movie was based on the term or something. But was there a movie called Sliders? Yeah, but I think it's a movie that was based on the term. I think okay. the term came first. Okay. So, yeah, it exists. It's a weird phenomena. Yeah. And I don't know why or how. It's just one of those things. It's like a chemical thing, I think. Is it? I think so. Some kind of... Magnetic? Magnetic chemical. Something with your physical makeup. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting thing. BMO writes in. It's an interesting name. It is. Yamo yeah, be there. Don't do that. <laughs> you know I was going to do it, didn't you? I did. Did you... Did, I almost put on there, don't say Yamo be don't there. Don't say Yamo be there. <laughs> Hi, guys. My name is Bimo, and I'm a native from Kokomo, Indiana. Been in Ohio for almost nine years. When I was a kid, about eight years old, my dad had left us when I was seven and a half years old. We decided to move from our house in McCann uh, Street to an apartment complex called Gateway Gardens, now uh, under a different name. There's been hauntings there since it was a military housing until it was uh, converted to civilian government housing. It had been said it was built on an Indian burial ground. The haunting didn't start since about a year after we had moved in back in the 1990s. Our mom had to work two jobs and she had just gotten home from working at the bar. She'd just gone to bed and woken up, three glow woken up to three glowing orbs. She thought we had gotten up and come into her room and she fled to our rooms only to find that we were asleep. At the time, we lived in a three-bedroom apartment. I had my own room and my brothers had to share a room. She had seen that we were still asleep and she went down the stairs to watch TV and even passed out. That morning, we overheard our mom talking about it on the phone to one of her friends. We all three looked at each other and scratched our heads. That night, when our mom had gone to work, she had turned off the lights down the stairs and the TV. We were all three alone at home asleep while mom went to her job at the bar. The TV and lights turned on down the stairs and the toilet flushed. We thought mom had hired a babysitter. She might have come in, and but never did. I had to admit I was a little freaked out and flicked on the lights to go downstairs to turn off the lamp and TV in the living room. I looked around and never saw anyone as it was hard to break in there since it the doors were heavy metal and walls and floors made out of concrete. I saw nothing. I was about to walk back upstairs until I saw a shadow walk by the living room window. I looked out the window and saw nothing there. But a few days after, I told my mom and she looked at me a little puzzled, like I ran into something. She was scared of the three orbs in her bedroom. But a few days later, I had to use the bathroom but felt like I was floating. I looked down. And my bed had been floating a few inches off the floor. And when I said, hey, I got to pee, my bed dropped and made a thump. I came out of the room, rubbing my eyes, walking to the bathroom, and my mom was looking at me from her bedroom. Why was I being so loud? I told her, and she rose a brow, thinking I was playing in my room. The next thing didn't happen until the summer of the next year, when my brother's window fell onto the heater in their room. We were all three in the room when it happened. And it was during the late afternoon, along with my childhood best friend, Melissa, I made us all jump. And after we had put the window back in our, uh, our room, my mom came upstairs and asked what had happened. We told her that the top of the window fell off. Melissa lived across from the sidewalk from us and told us that there was a little boy in their apartment that they could hear him giggling. I decided to stay the night with Melissa. And at this time, I was about 13. We were all downstairs, and it was about 6 p.m. during the summer break from school. I had to use the bathroom and stopped at the bathroom at the bottom of the stairs, only to see a little boy looking at me, smiling happily and waving. I turned around and told my friends I was going to go home and maybe stay the night some other time. We had minimal activity since then, but then two years later, we had another childhood visit from a neighboring town. His name was Jason, and he had stayed the weekend with us. 
The night had come, and we were playing Street Fighter Alpha 2 on the old Super NES. We saw the shadow of a man with a top hat walk past our living room window. We all kind of looked at each other, but it was only Jason and my brothers that freaked out. I, being used to this, tried to show him that it was only a ghost. Jason didn't believe me and called his mom, telling her, which only made her laugh. About a few weeks later, we were sitting on the couch watching TV. I felt a drip on my forehead, then wiped my forehead, causing my brothers to look at me. When I looked at my hand, I saw blood. I asked my brothers, and they said they did, they, they did feel anything or see anything. I ended up walking into the kitchen to go wash my hands until my mom blood had dripped on my forehead. She never said anything until we were in our mid-teens. Her place was haunted. I told her we already knew. The shadow man walking by our living room window and hearing the same things from friends and neighbors. But a few days later, a man down the road from us died in his apartment along with an elderly lady I was friends with and helped her clean her porches. Also passed away too. We were so excited to move when I was 16 after our mom had met our stepdad. Nowadays, I only have the spirits of my dogs and grandparents around, but no more bleeding ceilings, floating beds, toilets, flushing, etc. It was not a great experience, but it was one that I have never been able to forget. Hope you guys enjoy my story. It was not another experience I would not care to live through again when you're a kid for eight years. After some time, we learn to ignore it. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I have a few more I can submit to you later. Through Gateway Gardens. It was more than I wanted to say than in about interesting experiences. I think it's really interesting how it seemed like there was different entities in each of the different apartments. Mm -hmm. That they didn't just all have the same experience with the same entity. Mm -hmm. That there's a little boy across the hall, there's a shadow man here, there's something going on in the old people's apartment down the way. Lots of spirits. I wonder how old the complex is. Do they say that in there? No, but it's old enough that it's probably, you know, I mean, it's gone through two names, so. Sure. It's probably 50 years old. It's kind of a, an interesting name, too, for something that's holding all of the hauntings. Gateway. Mm-hmm. Gardens. <laughs> you know, it just it just has that, that feeling to it, like there's something else going on here. But I would imagine, you know, a lot of, I would imagine apartment buildings are probably ripe with a lot of hauntings. Yeah. In, in a lot of cases, especially older ones, especially ones where, you know, you've had folks who have been there for long periods of time mm -hmm. to get their, their home. And uh, as they get older, a lot of them end up passing there too. So I would imagine a lot of mixed energy. I'd imagine you probably have a lot of just fairly peaceful energy, people at home, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. You have some transition there. You have very peaceful old folks, and that's where their home is. And then you have a lot of, you know, probably nervous young energy, too, in apartments, too, with a lot of young people growing through a lot of years of turbulence there, too, yeah. which could be a very interesting mix. You know, and not necessarily meaning it's a bad apartment, just, you know, being young mm -hmm. and going through a lot of things, you know, in your early 20s in an apartment and such. Uh, I could see that energy mixing and really, you know, creating large batteries, sure, if you will, uh, of buildings. So very interesting, uh, interesting story. Thank you for uh, sharing that story with us. The phone number here is 855-853-4802 to share your real ghost story with us. Of course, the other way to get your ghost stories to us is through the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. So lots of ways to share your experiences with us here at Real Ghost Stories line. Let's go to a caller, Phyllis. Hi, my name is Phyllis, and I wanted to tell you what happened to me and several of my family members um, at events in this one rental cabin at a state park near New Orleans, Louisiana. It was my daughter's wedding three years ago and it was in the middle of a tropical storm, tropical storm Lee. And 
her wedding had been a washout because of the tropical storm. So since she had people from out of town coming, we rented a large log cabin at Fountain Blue State Park in Covington, rather, Mandeville, Louisiana, near New Orleans. And it was a large place. Uh, it was a living room and a kitchen and four bedrooms and two big baths. And it was lovely wraparound porch and very, very rustic. And she had her wedding there. Um, a member of the wedding group went to a nearby restaurant that was open and asked if they could give us, or rather, if he could buy food enough for all the people that were coming, and he did, and there was probably enough food for 200 people. And we put it in the kitchen, laid out, and people could use it like a uh, buffet. So the wedding took place, and uh, everybody started leaving. I was left there as the final person. They had cleaned up. Some other members had cleaned up um, and put all the food that was left into uh, bags and into larger bags, and nobody wanted to take it because it was still raining outside, and it was paying to get to the parking lot. So I said I would take it, and they put the bags by the front door, and they asked if I was leaving, and I said, no, I might spend the night, since it was rented for overnight. And I was decided to watch some football. My daughter and her new husband sat on the couch opposite me, and we chatted. And then they decided they would leave. They didn't want to stay. They felt uncomfortable. So they left, and I was there alone watching TV, watching the football game. And... I looked up and there was a door into the hallway that led to the kitchen and I saw something past that hallway and I thought it was just my imagination. And then I saw something again out of the corner of my eye and I looked in the doorway and there was a very large at that time, I didn't know that they were called shadow figures, um, standing in the doorway, not moving uh, or not moving away, but just standing there. And it appeared to be about oh, six and a half feet tall, had a definite upper body um, a figure to it, but no bottom. But it was all black. It was like a shadow. And I thought, well, somebody had to have gotten in the house, gotten in the cabin. Since there was a back door, after the shadow figure passed by that doorway, I quietly got brave, because I've never been really scared of this stuff, and walked into the back and checked the back door. It was locked. There were no lights on in the back of the house. So I went and I said, well, I don't know what that was. It was probably a car light or something, even though we were not on the highway or not near. We were in the woods, basically. There was no lights to be seen. So <clears throat> I went back and sat down and watched TV, but I kept looking over at that doorway where I had seen that figure, and lo and behold, in my face, I looked at it. It was there. There was that six and a half foot tall shadow figure standing there. It had no face. I looked at it and I said, okay, I get the message. I'm leaving. And then it disappeared to what I thought was the kitchen, to into the kitchen. I didn't go see this time. So <clears throat> I walked around the house, the cabin, and turned all the lights off to make sure all the lights were turned off before I left and picked up 
the bags of food, it was pretty heavy, turned off the light in the living room where I was sitting, and locked the door. I walked to my car in the parking lot, which was fairly far away, and t unlocked my trunk, turned around, and looked at the house, and all the lights in the house were on. I walked back to the door and said, all right, I'm going to turn the lights off out loud. So I walked in and turned the lights off, the ones that uh, were in the front, so I didn't have to go in the back of the cabin. Turned them off, walked back to my car very quickly, turned around to get in my car. The lights were back on. This happened one more time, and I said, I'm not doing it again. I'm not going back in. So I drove out of the park and to return the key to the ranger. And I said, there's something weird going on back there. I said, do you all have a timer for your lights in the cabin? And he said, no, we don't. They just go on and off as people see fit. And he said, I said, I saw something there that was scary. And he says, we get that. People tell us that all the time. I was frightened, I left. Three years later, this past May, my husband and I rented that same cabin because it's been in my brain since then. And we decided to have a 20 year anniversary, wedding anniversary for us there in that house, in that cabin. We had about 80 people, had food, Everybody ate, had a good time. We enjoyed the summertime in the porch. Everything was fine. My nephew, who was three, was very nervous. He looked around the house and he wouldn't leave the front of the house, the living room, where there were a lot of people. And then we get a phone call after the party. We get a phone call at our home and it was his mother who said, he saw a shadow person in one of the bedrooms and he was very scared and that he liked our party but he didn't like being there and when i saw him the next time i saw him i asked him logan did you like our party he said the same thing to me yes i liked your party but i didn't like the place where you had it there were things and so to let you know, I full heartedly believe that in that very old cabin, there is something going on. Thank you. Well, there you go. Yeah. It's like the great outdoors. That was really brave of her to go back willingly on an important <laughs> anniversary, not just check it out on a weekend. I know. I mean, uh, that would be like, hey, honey, can we go uh, rent the Amityville house for one night? Just, yeah. you know, just for fun, for anniversary? That's what it would be like. <laughs> oh, man. I don't think I would have gone back. And that's funny that the little boy saw the shadow person, too. Mm -hmm. And kids, I mean, that what? Uh, how more honest could you be? Mm -mm. You know, I liked your party, but there was, what did he say? There was. I didn't like where you had it. I didn't like where you had it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not, not a kid being mean or it's just, kid, there was, knew there was something up. That's wow. Interesting, interesting story. Thank you for, for calling in and, and sharing that experience uh, with us here at Real Ghost Stories Online. The number is 855-853-4802. Let's go over to Brooke. Hi. Hello, my name is Brooke. Hey, I just heard a story about a man talking about his grandmother's saying that they heard a scream before they before they lose someone in the family. Well, there is a story about that. Um, I have heard of a, a being called a banshee. And sometimes those things would scream and when you hear them, that means somebody you know or close to you is gonna die. And sometimes when you see a banshee, that means either you're gonna die or you're gonna have some kind of a deadly illness. Now, I've heard about this on some documentaries. So it is something that is worth looking into and, and possibility share with that person that who shared his stories about his grandmothers. 
who heard the screams before somebody died. So, uh, I just hope you can share this story. Thank you. And it goes back to Irish folklore. Okay. It's a fairy type woman that wails as an omen of death. Okay. I know I had heard of Banshee before, sure. but that's only because my mom always, always used to say when my brother and I were running around acting crazy that we were screaming like Banshees. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's a term used all, you know, yeah. very commonly. But I did not know what that was. It's a uh, omen of death. Yeah. There you go. So I think we should just be more descriptive when uh, when we're talking to the kids. Stop making noises like the scary omen of death woman. Uh, yeah. that, that may make them stop in their tracks. Yeah. Banshee, you're like, nah, whatever. <laughs> you sound like the omen of death. I never knew what it was. There you go. 855-853-4802 is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us, your experiences, all that. Lots of ways uh, to do that. Uh, let's uh, let's see here. Let's go to Alex in Minnesota and uh, listen to your call here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi, Alex. Let's hear it. Hi, guys. This is Alex. Um, I live in Minnesota, and I love your show. It's great to hear people with other experiences, so I don't think that I'm crazy. Um, I thought I'd share one of my stories uh, from my old house or my family's house. I have a lot of stories from there, but I'll just say one. Um, long story short, though, that property turned out to be an Indian burial ground that we didn't know we lived on, but we found that out. Um, and it is a hub for spirit activity and a lot of things go on there. But the first thing that ever happened to me was I was home alone. I was about 13 at the time. We had only lived in the house for about three months and I was sitting in the living room and I heard, or I was with my dog and I heard this just blood curdling scream, like somebody was being murdered upstairs and I was terrified. So I was 13, I thought somebody had broken into my house and I'm sitting on the couch and I call my dad and my dad tells me that nobody broke into the house, you're fine. And he tells me to put my dog on a leash and take my dog upstairs and my dog will tell me if there's anyone up there. So I went upstairs and I went bedroom to bedroom and the first three bedrooms are fine. But when I got into my sister's bedroom, my dog just went absolutely insane and started barking and growling. And I had never heard him do this before because he was a golden retriever and he's got a very sweet disposition. But um, I just decided that was, I shouldn't go in there anymore. So I ended up going outside in the middle of a Minnesota winter and sitting outside until my parents came home. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with me and I have since moved on from that house as I'm in college now. And I fully believe that one of the spirits attached him, themselves to me because uh, even in my new apartment in uh, Minneapolis, I have spirit activity. Um, and it's pretty insane. So, I mean, if you guys have any input, that would be great. I don't know why there's spirit attached to me, but I'm going to go before I get cut off. But, uh, I love your guys' show and thanks for giving people like me the opportunity to tell our stories. Thanks for, um, for calling in and sharing that uh, experience with us. You know, I think spirits can choose to attach to you just the way when people are alive, you just never know who's going to match up with who you know like you can choose your friends you can choose your friends you pick who you date mm -hmm. they just choose you for whatever reason you can choose your friends but they can't choose your ghosts <laughs> yeah exactly that's the new saying okay that's it you can choose your friends but you can't choose your ghosts okay so choose your friends wisely i don't know how the two correlate yeah i was gonna say why i don't know there's some sort of hidden meaning there. It's like, oh, oh, that's the deeper meaning to that. I don't. I have no deeper meaning to it. I was just thinking of words that somehow sound like there's a deeper meaning to it. Okay. That's a, can you can you rid yourself of the ghosts then too of of the ghosts that decide to to hang out with you? Do you think we have the ability to do that? You have the ability to ask, but they have the ability to choose to stay. It's true. A lot of times they'll go, so it's not 
you know, it's not a bad idea to just try by asking. Mm -hmm. Unless they're a real clingy ghost. Clingy ghost. Clingy ghost. Static cling. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. That's what you use a dryer sheets. You just rub them all over yourself. Yep. It gets rid of the ghosts. (laughs) Hey, there's many uses for dryer sheets. That's a new one. Okay. 855-853-4802 855-853-4802 is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online. If you like the show, please support it. Become an EPP, extra podcast person. It's only $5 a month, and that's what keeps this thing on the air. You sign up on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Get access to more than 50 bonus episodes of our show, exclusive video content, and more. Please help keep this thing going. Sign up, realghoststoriesonline.com. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode. Real Ghost Stories Online.